Galore, Lord. I call the members to order. I'd like to welcome Jack Sargent to the Senate and congratulate him. And congratulate you on your recent by-election success. You are following in a tradition of proud representatives of Allen and Deeside in this uh, place, and we all wish you well. Jack Sargent. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I firstly uh, thank you for letting me make this statement today? Uh, it really, really it means a lot to me. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the members um, across this chamber for their words uh, and of congratulations following the, the recent by-election uh, in Allen and Deeside. From the members of the security team, the catering staff, the AIM support staff, not to forget the drivers, the kind of words of congratulations has been really, really overwhelming. It is customary, of course, to pay tribute to, uh, in your first statement, to pay tribute to your predecessor. Not often, though, are they in the, those circumstances that I find myself in today. Because not only am I paying tribute to someone who loved his constituency and who loved Wales and fought tire tirelessly across uh, his constituency and across Wales for those who are less able to stand up for themselves, I'm also paying tribute to the man that I knew as dad. The man I loved going for a pint with, the man who helped me with my exams, the man who stood by my side right way through life and stood so proud when I graduated. The man that was the glue of my family and held us together on many, many occasions. But he was also the man who showed me that being the right sort of politician wasn't about being the right sort of politician in the assembly chamber. But it was something that you did in every interaction <coughs> with every person, no matter who they were or what their situation was. It was important to him that their issues and concerns were listened to and understood. And although we know that was my dad, we've been touched and comforted by the outpouring support and solidarity that we've seen from people right across Allen and Deeside, right across Wales and across the United Kingdom. And here in the Assembly, I know you all knew him as my dad as well. We are, of course, devastated beyond words, and we know that our grief will continue to be shared by everyone who knew him and loved him, and many others, strangers who didn't have the chance to meet him. And I also want to say how proud I am to have uh, friends and family here in the gallery today uh, watching me uh, on my first session. So thank you to, to you, all of you here today, and, and all the family members and friends uh, across Allen and Eastside and further afield. My dad was truly loved by his community and the people, the special people of Allen and Deeside. He loved the sense of togetherness and our community's problems was everyone's problems. That's clear by the way the local people come together when times get tough. Allen and Deeside has been through many a tough times, but it's that sense of community and looking after each other that we as a family have seen more than ever in recent months. Like much of North East Wales, it has a large manufacturing base. It's something we're all so proud of, and we're also so proud that it's not just holding its own where we are now, but we're also moving into the forefront of the manufacturing industry and embracing the new technology to create jobs for the future. Great jobs for the future. But we must carry on and we must do more to build, to give better opportunities to our young people and all those, our current generation as well, to make sure our communities have the right infrastructure and services for the future. The Airbus plant in Broughton employs 7,000 people and supports businesses directly and indirectly right across the region and further into the northwest of England as well. The plant specialises in manufacturing wings and the majestic beluga, transporting those wings once they are completed all across Europe. I was pleased to meet with United Shop Stewards during the campaign and I look forward to returning there soon to discuss what we can do further. My constituency is also the home of Deeside College, College Cambria, which has students right across North East Wales and Cheshire. 
and I gained my engineering apprenticeship there, which I'm so very proud of. And I want to see it to continue to grow from strength to strength. And I want to see that the young people benefit from the opportunities that we and the college provide them. Opportunities which, if we get right, can put Wales in the forefront of our industrial revolution. And for those sporting fanatics, there is a st strong local heritage in Allen and Deeside. And Deeside College's uh, main stadium is the, the home of, of Gap Coniskey Nomads, which I had the pleasure to, to visit uh, it, during the campaign as well with, with Tom Watson, which was great. Not only that, we've had some great footballers from the constituency, Michael Owen, uh, the late Gary Speed, which was fantastic to meet with Roger Speed just, just on Sunday. What a, what a true gentleman he was. But I would never be able to let this down if I couldn't fan, uh, thank and uh, mention my own local team, FC Nomads of Connors Key, and club chairman uh, Bernie Attridge. So uh, I really want to say thank you to everything he's done, and we'll keep that support going. And good luck on the weekend, guys. Now, I said last week that this by-election was a by-election that no one wanted to see. And I am not the only person in this chamber who wants justice for my father, my dad. I know from the campaign we have just conducted that this feeling is shared by the constituents and the community, but further across field in Wales and the UK as well. And alongside my political work in this chamber, I will also be working to ensure that the inquiries on the way will examine in which way the way my dad was treated in the run-up to his death. I owe my family, my friends, my constituents, and no less my dad for that. Finally, presiding officer, I was truly honoured and humbled to have been elected as the areas, our great areas, uh, new Labour AM last week. And I want to thank all the local Labour members and others for their work during the campaign, during the snow when we got out on that doorstep. And I also want to thank all the colleagues from the Assembly that came up to, to help me with that in the, 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 uh, a Tuesday, a snowy Tuesday in February. So thank you all. But most importantly, I want to thank the voters of Allen and Deeside for putting their faith in me. I'm in this place to be a strong voice representing the interest building on the work started by my dad. Jobs and skills, aiming to end youth homelessness and working to end the ec epidemic of domestic violence, domestic abuse, and work to ensure that this government listens to people, real people from my constituency and across North Wales and the whole of Wales. Real, real people, and we deliver the policies which will work for them. And there is no greater tribute I could pay to my dad than continuing his legacy and his work and all the service that he provided for our special people up in Allen and Deeside. That's what I intend to do and I hope as the representative of the new generation in the Assembly I can do something to build a better kind of politics for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jack Sargent. So the next item is questions to the First Minister, and the first question, Caroline Jones. Will the First Minister outline how the Welsh Government is tackling poverty in South Wales West? Yes, Prosperity for All sets out how we will support people from disadvantaged households to achieve their potential and live fulfilled lives, and we are investing in the future of our children and growing our economy. The Valleys Ministerial Task Force will improve outcomes as well, of course, for the Valleys of South Wales West. Thank you, First Minister. Um, my region is now one of the poorest regions in the UK. It has the lowest employment rate in Wales, high levels of economic inactivity and some of the lowest gross disposable household income in the UK. <coughs> After nearly 20 years of Labour's economic plans, things are going in the wrong direction. 
My region doesn't need economic tinkering like the disastrous Techniums, nor empty enterprise zones. It needs a low-tax, business-friendly economy to encourage businesses to invest in the region. The world's most successful small computing can you, platform... Can you come to a question, please? Yes, is, is already produced in Bridgend in my region. We should be building a high-tech cluster around Pencoid and lower taxes in the catalyst we need. First Minister, what discussions have you had with your colleague, the Finance Secretary, about emulating Ireland and encouraging high-tech businesses like Intel and Apple to set up shop in Wales by offering them tax breaks once we are free from EU state aid rules? Now, let me just understand this point if I can. Last week, UKIP were arguing that they didn't want to see new taxes. And now they're saying they want to see business taxes, which aren't devolved, aren't devolved. You want to see business taxes devolved to this assembly. Is that what you're saying? Because that, that's the logical consequence of what you're saying. And then we have the next question. How do you pay then for public services if there is a gap in the uh, public tax take? And I have to say that she contradicted herself in the course of that question. She said that South Wales West was one of the poorest areas of Wales. Then she went on to name some of the successes, one of them in my uh, constituency, uh, that uh, we have seen as a result of the Welsh Government's uh, work in attracting investment into Wales. What is UKIP's economic plan? Cut us off from our closest, most important market, where 60% of our exports go, where 90% of our food and drink exports go. That is not an economic plan that will work it for the future. An and I can say, as far as GBA figures are concerned, we know that Wales is the fastest growing country in the UK for GBA, GBA rising to nearly £60 billion in 2016. And we know that our employment rate is continuing to grow. That's because of the hard work we have put in as a Welsh Government, making sure that we have jobs for our people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chloe. The focus on economic development in South Wales West is based on creating two strategic hubs in Neath and North Bridgen as part of the Valleys Task Force, as I'm sure you're well aware. And a key element of that is the release of employment land for industrial use. Now, given that that is also the case for most of the strategic hubs across the rest of the South Wales Valleys, do you agree that there's a risk that unless specific uh, sectors and companies are targeted in a systemic way, that your government risks flooding the market with a release of land which you simply will not be able to fill? No, that's the old WDA model, where you have land, you build lots of uh, empty buildings, and uh, those buildings are not filled. Uh, we want to make sure that as far as uh, demand is concerned, it's uh, closely matched to uh, supply. And, of course, we look at areas of Wales where there is the skills base to attract further uh, investment. And that's precisely, of course, why we have an economic action plan that has at its heart the need to target regions of Wales according to their strengths. Mick Antony. Uh, First Minister, we were told in a recent uh, committee uh, evidence session into homelessness that one of the main causes now of homelessness is the UK Government's welfare reform programme. Do you agree that even at this late stage, it is not too late for the UK Government to stop the rollout of this disastrous uh, universal credit programme? Yeah, absolutely, but they're not listening, are they? I went to uh, visit people who were homeless before Christmas. I advise the Conservatives to do the same. Perhaps they might learn something. But the reality is that they are indifferent to the suffering of people who are homeless. They are indifferent to the problem of rough sleeping. The Leader of the Opposition sits there from his country estate and condemns people who are being homeless. That is the reality of where he comes from. We as a party have committed £10 million to ending. I know it hurts. I know it hurts you. And I know, you, know, you don't like the truth. I understand that. We have committed £10 million to end the scourge of youth homelessness while the Conservatives have sat and done nothing. Question die. Question two, Mick Antony. First Minister, what discussions have you had with the UK Government on the post-Brexit economic forecast for Wales? Uh, well, I've repeatedly and consistently raised with the Prime Minister and other UK Government Ministers the potential serious economic harm to Wales arising from Brexit. And that includes highlighting the analysis that we published in our Securing Wales's Future White Paper last year and our recent trade policy document. Well, First Minister, it seems the cat is now out of the bag that the Government's real evidence as to the impact of 
Brexit without access to the single market uh, is something that's going to cause significant damage to the Welsh economy. It appears only AMs uh, in Wales are allowed to see these documents, provided we do that within certain restricted uh, conditions, uh, that our members of the public, our constituents, aren't allowed to share this information. Uh, but the outcome of those, that evidence is that effectively, depending upon what level of access we may or may not have to the, the European market, that we will suffer an economic hit of around 1.5% or up to 9.5% to our economy. If we had a 9% hit to our Welsh economy, what would be the implications for Wales of jobs and the standard of living of the Welsh people? Well, we will lose jobs and incomes would, uh, would decline. I, I can't understand why the UK government is being so secretive about these, uh, these analyses and not sharing them more widely with people. Uh, it doesn't sound to me like a great deal of transparency certainly is exercised by the UK government in, uh, in Whitehall. And can I say, that the one thing that we are lacking here is that there are those who say that we will be better off outside the single market and the customs union. Not one scrap of evidence has been produced to support that. Not one scrap of evidence. And the reality is, it's about time that the Tories moved away from wishful thinking, saying, yeah, it'll all be fine, don't worry about it. Don't worry about the experts, don't worry about the analyses, don't worry about the reports, they're all wrong. And came clean with the people of Britain and said, well, actually, when we say we want to leave the single market and the customs union, we were wrong, because everybody else can see that that's exactly what's happening now. Russell George. Uh, Post-Brexit, uh, First Minister, uh, can I ask what plans does the Welsh Government have to dramatically increase economic, Wales's economic uh, intelligence capacity in order to improve public uh, policy planning and delivery in Wales? Well, of course, we have uh, IPBW, but also uh, we're looking to uh, increase the number of offices in key markets abroad, working, of course, with the appropriate UK Government departments. And that is something we're doing in the course of this year. Uh, we find that they are exceptionally important in terms of sourcing potential investment, sourcing potential markets for Welsh produce. I know how important our Dubai office was to us when we got Welsh lamb into the United Arab Emirates. And so looking for new markets is an important part of the plan we have to deal with Brexit. Adam Price. Uh, my gross serve, Louis Vien. It's over a year since you published the white paper making the case for Wales to remain within the single market and the customs union. Now, you haven't been able to persuade Theresa May of the merits of that policy, and perhaps you can be forgiven for that, but why haven't you been able to convince Jeremy Corbyn? I'm not responsible for what happens in London. I have discussed this in detail with Keir Starmer, and of course I know that the Labour Party's policy changes according to the circumstance, but may I say that as far as we're concerned, the best way for Wales to ensure that we have prosperous economic future is to remain in the customs union and in the free market. Questions now from the party leaders, leader of the Conservatives, Andrew Arty David. Could I extend a welcome to the new member from Alan Deeside on behalf of the Welsh Conservatives in the National Assembly and wish him well in his political career. Yeah. First Minister, last week um, Howell Var came forward with a projected deficit at the end of the financial year of some £70 million. Uh, this builds on two previous deficits of £47 million and £32 million in the previous two years. In 2000, October 2016, this health board was taken into targeted intervention, uh, and that targeted intervention was worked by the Welsh Government to build a sound financial footing. What's gone wrong? Uh, I should have welcomed our new member as well, our youngest member. I've done it personally, uh, and I joined the uh, Leader of the Opposition in, uh, in doing that. What can I say? The Health Secretary has made it clear to the Howell Dar Board that the level of deficit is unacceptable. He's also been clear that difficult decisions are needed to ensure the future sustainability of health services in Howell Dar. The Board were given a clear target. Uh, to not exceed their planned deficit of £58.9 million, but it wasn't until December that they said they would miss this target. There are still significant concerns with financial management and reporting within the board, which we are following up in detail with them, and we are confident that the health board will still balance overall in the current year, even with this increased deficit in Howell Law. 
First Minister, my question was, what's gone wrong? This is a health board that was put into, uh, I think the word is targeted intervention, uh, some 18 months ago, uh, along with three other health boards, and obviously the special measures health boards of Betsy up in the north. So four of our health boards are under some form of government intervention. This escalation in the deficit, up to £70 million, building on two previous substantial deficits, clearly shows that that financial oversight, and it was specific to financial oversight that the Welsh Government intervened, is not working in this health board. Now, we know there's a consultation about reorganisation of health services in Howellvar. We know from the apology you gave last week that uh, you don't give apologies that easy, in fairness, and come into this chamber because of the misinformation that our health board handed over to you. Really, how can anyone have any confidence in the ability of the health board to deliver health services in West Wales for an excess of 10% of the population of Wales? £70 million deficit. How on earth is that deficit going to be brought back under control whilst maintaining services and getting on top of waiting lists? Well, I, I should have uh, clarified we're confident the health budget will still balance uh, overall rather than the health board budget and make that clear. Well, look, the health boards, all health boards across Wales, have a duty to ensure safe and sustainable services. That means they have to put forward suggestions for how that is to be done. I appeal to members not to just oppose any changes as they uh, arise, because there are difficult questions here. And in fairness, the parliamentary review has looked at uh, how we make the health system in Wales and social care system more sustainable in the future. We need to have a serious examination of what should be provided where. Sure, services as close to home as possible, but that might mean service changes in, in the future. And these are issues which need to be looked at dispassionately and sensibly uh, before any, uh, any decisions are taken. First Minister, you talk about members looking at changes. One of your own ministers has said that she would vote against any changes uh, that will come, come forward uh, from the consultation. Uh, so from within your government, yeah, uh, people that. are casting that aspersions about the consultation process. I've put to you twice now the escalation in the deficit situation that Howellvar faces. £70 million, £148 million of deficit over three years. It's not unreasonable for people in West Wales, as I said, in excess of 10% of the Welsh population rely on that local health board to deliver health services in rural locations. I really would appreciate, I'm sure many members in this institution, along with members of the communities down in West Wales, some roadmap that the Welsh Government might have to rescue this situation, because the deficit is getting worse, waiting times are getting worse, the ability to attract staff to fill vacancies is not succeeding, and in fact workforce planning is woefully inadequate in that part of Wales, as we know. So on the third question, can you give us a roadmap of what the Welsh Government will be doing with the Health Board to bring this deficit under control so people can have confidence that they will have a health service in this part of Wales? Yeah. Well, firstly, he's not correct in terms of what he's quoted the, uh, the Minister as saying. Secondly, the Health Board have published a consultation uh, which contains various options. Difficult, some of them. I have a question about that, but it's the Health Board's responsibility to come forward with proposals, and that's exactly what it has done. And I have to say to the Leader of the Opposition, we have seen for eight years cuts in the Welsh budget. We could be £4 billion by one estimate better off if he had actually made representations to his government in London. But he has sat there and done nothing. Ruth Davidson sits in the UK cabinet. He isn't allowed through the door. The Northern Ireland executive was given a billion pounds, if I remember rightly, for health, uh, certainly hundreds of millions of pounds. Wales received nothing. There was no consequential. There was no extra money for Scotland and Wales. Can I suggest? that while we are sorting out the mechanics of how our health boards work, he actually does something and does what his Scottish colleague does and actually stand up for his own... Yeah. Can I move a point? Uh, Leader of Plight. You've had the first minister's No, no, there is no point of order. Leanne Wood. Deol Llawydd, uh, first minister, um, you stated last September that you wanted to see a justice system, and I quote, that was truly representative of Welsh needs. The priorities are to improve access to justice, to reduce crime, and to promote rehabilitation. We know that your commission is due to report back in 2019, but that's a little bit late to ensure that justice policy can be devolved in a decisive and clear way in time for the next Welsh Parliament. Are you confident that the case for a distinctive Welsh justice system will be strengthened by your commission? 
and that quick progress can be made if it reports back with compelling evidence for change. Well, yes, I mean, on, on the, uh, the swift change, that is a matter, of course, to the UK government, but we would urge them to uh, follow the recommendations in the report. We've tended to focus on what this would mean for the courts, the probation service, and also, of course, the issue of the jurisdiction, which have been well uh, debated within this chamber. But, of course, if we look at the justice system, we have to develop a Welsh penal policy, something we've never had before, and something that we'd have to start from scratch. So all these things have to be examined carefully as we look at the uh, potential devolution of, of justice. So the jurisdiction point, to me, uh, is, is unanswerable. And this is the only jurisdiction anywhere in the world, common law jurisdiction, where there are two legislatures in the same jurisdiction. It makes no sense. I mean, I know people out there are not exactly uh, writing the streets on this issue, but it makes no sense from a legal perspective. It means that people are misled uh, when they look at the law. Some people believe that when a bill is titled, and Simon Thomas brought this to the chamber a few months ago, this is the law of England and Wales, but it doesn't apply in Wales. It causes confusion, it makes no sense, and it's always been the case that where a legislature acquires primary powers, that the jurisdiction always follows. That's one issue, but then, of course, we get on to you know, what should a Welsh penal policy look like in the future. I agree with you, First Minister, and that's why it's such a shame that the opportunity was missed when the, the last uh, Wales Bill was going through. There is one case that demonstrates to me in a, in a very striking way why we must have control over our criminal justice system and why that must happen soon. The case of Conor Marshall of Barry demonstrated huge failings in the probation system. He was brutally murdered by someone who was on probation, who was not being sufficiently supervised uh, under the system that has been privatised since 2014. Connor's murderer missed eight probation appointments. Now, there's a clear link between privatisation of the probation service, the pursuit of profit, and poor performance and su in supervision and monitoring. There has been no improvement in probation outcomes since privatisation began. Staff numbers are down 30% and re-offending re rates are up. First Minister, leaving Welsh probation services in the hands of Westminster has not worked. The case of Conor Marshall shows that the public is not safe under this system. Will you support Conor Marshall's family's call for an inquiry into the actions of working links in this case? And when Wales does uh, gain responsibility for criminal justice policy, do you agree with me that probation services should be brought back under public control? Well, I'm not familiar with, with, the, uh, with the case, but I will look at it and write back. I think that's the proper way to, do, to deal with what the uh, leader of Plaid Cymru has asked for. I couldn't agree more. We're in agreement a lot this afternoon. I couldn't agree more with what you said. Why would you take a service that is designed to rehabilitate offenders and try and make a profit out of it? You know, I, th there is no sense in that, and I absolutely agree that uh, I say, hopefully when, not if, we get control of the probation service, that we can have a properly uh, functioning publicly run an accountable probation service in the future, not what we have now. Because clearly, uh, to my mind, the case is, well, not just the case is not made for a privately run probation service, it's, it's been uh, uh, something that I don't think has been a great success. And she is somebody who, with her background, is passionate about uh, probation and the need to rehabilitate offenders. It does society no good at all if they do not have the means and ability to find a way to rehabilitate themselves and, re and remove themselves as a nuisance or a danger to the public. Uh, and in the future, I'd like to see a situation where it is in this chamber uh, and, of course, through the Welsh Government that the probation service is shaped in Wales. Again, First Minister, I have to express regret to you that we weren't having this discussion before. We could have prevented the privatisation of the probation service. I do now, though, want to turn to the question of super prisons. I'm appalled to see prisons uh, held up as a tool for economic development when their main role is to deliver rehabilitation through custodial sentences. Prisoners now are being moved uh, to Wales, who are not from Wales, to serve their custodial sentences. And that means that they moved further away from their families and support networks. And as you know, being close to your family and support network is a, a very important aspect of rehabilitation. Figures this week show a concerning range, range of incidents that have taken place in HMP Berwyn within its first year of operation, which surely raises questions about the need for another super pri prison at, uh, at Port Talbot. If we were developing a Welsh justice system, we would not need a new super prison. 
while prison, uh, prison services are not devolved, you can make the decision on the sale of Welsh Government land for the Port Albert Super Prison. Will you now commit to using that land for sustainable economic development and not a prison? And will you make a commitment that you will not facilitate a super prison that doesn't meet the need, needs of Wales? We have had questions of the Ministry of Justice which have not yet been satisfactorily answered. Uh, we have taken no decision on the sale of the land. I know the representations that have been made. In some ways, the issue is bound up with the Commission for Justice in the sense of what should a Welsh penal policy or Welsh sentencing policy as well look like uh, in the future. Uh, it's right to say there are Welsh prisoners serving sentences a long way from home as well in England, the category of prisons in England. How do, we, how do we resolve that situation to ensure that people can serve their sentences closer to home, certainly towards the end of their sentences when they are closer to a release and, we hope, uh, rehabilitation? Uh, but as I say, as far as Baglin is concerned, uh, no decision has been taken. Uh, we uh, are not yet in a position where we feel confident that we can take a decision because the full information has not been provided. Leader of the UKIP group, Neil Hamilton. Then, with permission, I'd also like to welcome Jack Sargent to the Assembly and to congratulate him on the maturity of his opening speech very confidently delivered, and we look forward to hearing a lot more of him. Um, the First Minister will know that lots of people in North Wales think the letters NHS stands for National Health Shambles. Since uh, 2010, the NHS has cut the number of beds in Wales by 18%, but in Betsy Cadwallader Health Board, they've been cut by even more, down by 21%. Ten days ago, the Betsy Cadwallader senior staff met with Denby councillors to explain why they're cutting 10 beds in Denby Hospital, but only opening five in Rhythin. Last week, the Daily Post reported that health chiefs are blaming extraordinary ongoing pressures for patients sleeping in equipment rooms and in corridors in Clandidno General Hospital because of a lack of hospital beds. And uh, Margaret Cohen, who was visiting her father in that hospital, said there used to be 12 wards in Clandidno. Now we have only three left. The people of this town deserve to know what is going on. Can the First Minister tell the people of Wales what is going on in the National Health Service in Wales? Well, funding it at a level higher than England. That's what happens with the health service in, in Wales, making sure uh, that, we, that the money is available for health and social care. We're seeing social care collapsing in England. We're seeing councils de declaring themselves, Tory councils declaring themselves bankrupt in England. So making sure the money is there. Yes, there are challenges, and we know that. And those challenges will need to be met head on by the health boards. But uh, he says national health shambles. Perhaps he would like to, you know, put that to the doctors and nurses who work in the health service, both in North Wales and elsewhere. And let me remind him, and I'll take him there perhaps when it's built, of the Cernic in Asputty Glancloyd, a major investment, a major investment in Asputty Glancloyd, an investment decision that was taken by me at a time when it was being suggested that those services should move over the border. I made sure that an independent uh, group of experts was brought together and a case was made to ensure that it was built in a sputty Glancloyd. So we will ensure that where those services can be made available to the people of North Wales, that they are made available, and the Cernic is an example of that. The knows that uh, for every success there are masses of failures, and uh, four of the health boards out of seven are in special measures or target intervention, as the Leader of the Opposition pointed out earlier on. The Welsh Labour Government has a direct responsibility for the state of the health service in Wales. The Cabinet Secretary chairs meetings of the uh, Betsy Cadwallader Health Board now, uh, and a statement was issued on the 1st of February saying that the Welsh Government continues to work with the Board to ensure patients are not adversely affected by the need to improve <coughs> financial management. We know, though, from the report uh, uh, that Deloitte's made on the uh, Financial Recovery Group in Betsy uh, that uh, governance structure is poorly defined and misunderstood by board members <laughs> themselves. This Financial Recovery Group meets in private. It doesn't publish any of its papers, and it doesn't actually publish any minutes. So there's a secret financial recovery review which is being hidden from the members of the public. Why doesn't the First Minister take special measures himself to ensure that public confidence can be increased by being more open and transparent, just as in Hawaldar we had problems only two weeks or so ago because of leaked reports? Why don't we have a more open and transparent <laughs> health system? Why don't we make it more democratic? Well, I can say the Cabinet Secretary has increased the oversight from ourselves on actions to reduce the forecast 
in terms of the finances and to ensure services and patients are not adversely affected by the need to improve financial management. We have said that. We expect the financial recovery actions to result in the Health Board meeting the revised forecast at the end of this year. We commissioned the Deloitte report in order to uh, assist uh, both the Board and ourselves in terms of planning for the uh, future. And the Board is expected to demonstrate progress on the actions in that report to meet the recommendations set out in, uh, by, uh, rather by April of this year. Uh First Minister will remember that last week, uh, in my uh, paper on, the, uh, on the, uh, my question on the agenda, um, I, I noted that the Deloitte report said that the f financial and strategic planning at the Health Board is simplistic, with budgets generally rolled forward into next year. And again, the leader of the opposition pointed out the disastrous financial performance of, of the, these boards. Uh, parts of the, this Deloitte report also said there is limited insight regarding how the Health Board is ultimately going to recover the financial position and a distinct lack of secondary questioning from board members to facilitate detailed debate and discussion across key areas of risk. Executive level leadership capability and capacity needs to be enhanced. Labour has been in charge of the health service in Wales for 20 years nearly, since 1999. Does he accept personal responsibility for presiding over a health service that in many parts of the country is worthy only of the third world? That is a wholly outrageous comment. Let me, let me just educate him a little so he looks beyond his own nose. The third world is an old-fashioned and discriminatory description anyway. We talk of the developing world these days. Let me tell you. So, there was a hospital in Uganda in, in Mbale serving seven million people. And it oh, several million people. It had seven consultants serving all those people. You could have an endoscopy there, but if the endoscopy discovered some uh, issue that had to be resolved, whether it was perhaps a stomach ulcer or worse, there was no treatment. People died of stomach cancer because they could not afford the treatment. Half the patients who entered that hospital went in there with malaria, which the doctors found very difficult to, uh, to treat. Yes, they were able to perform miracles when it came to A&E, but many, many people died of preventable illnesses. And he stands there and he compares the Welsh Health Service with a thousand consultants for three million people and he compares it with that, that those conditions I saw in Mbale. He belittles the people of Mbale and Uganda by his appalling comments. Question three, David, Question three, David Rowland. Uh, will the First Minister outline the Welsh Government's concerns about the future of the Welsh agricultural industry in the light of Brexit? Well, for decades, uh, EU policy frameworks have shaped the management of our land, underpinned patterns of food production and supported farm incomes. And post-Brexit, our primary producers will be more exposed to global markets, and there will be greater friction in trading systems with significant negative consequences for the, for the sheep meat sector in particular. Well, I thank you uh, for your answer, First Minister. But do you really believe that the EU and the CAP regime has been an unmitigated success story for the Welsh farming industry? Because if so, perhaps you and those supporting our presence in the European Union can explain to me the efficacy of seeing our hill farmers reduced to subsistence level on £12,000 per year while some farmers in the southeast of England have become millionaires under this iniquitous regime. These hill farmers are a symbol of a once proud industry brought to its knees in becoming a begging bowl economy of grants and regulations. And add to this the fact that the common agricultural policy is universally accepted as being an environmental disaster. Surely the First Minister has to agree that we are better off out. Well, uh, I'm sure the leader of the Welsh Conservatives would agree with every word that the, uh, the UKIP member has, uh, has said. I doubt that somehow. You're a point. CAP you has been know. the method by which we have ensured that farmers are able to survive. It has supported farmers, supported rural economies, their social, cultural, environmental and linguistic development for many, many years. Years. Is he now saying that he does not want there to be any kind of support for farmers in the future? Because I can tell him, as far as environmental schemes are concerned, we had Tir Canal, we had Tir Gova, we had Glassy, we have schemes that help to uh, support the, uh, the environment. 200, over £200 million a year comes into Wales in European subsidies. At the moment, there is no guarantee beyond a certain year that we'll get a penny of money at all. I invite him, 
I invite him to go to any hill farm in Wales and express his view that those farmers are holding a begging bull out and see what response he gets. Mark Reckless. First Minister, when I took an assembly committee to Dublin and met the Taoiseach, I learnt how Ireland benefits by £2 billion because of privileged access to our beef and dairy markets in a customs union, with a quarter of our beef coming from Ireland. Isn't it the case that outside a customs union, it would be our choice either to trade freely and buy beef more cheaply elsewhere, or if we preferred tariffs, to buy that beef from Welsh and UK farmers instead? Cheap food is code for undermining British farming. That's what it means, because if you're not prepared to support the farming industry, not, not even with tariffs, then you end up with the cheapest imports coming in and wiping out our farming industry. That's what will happen. It's simple economics and something that uh, has not been properly explained by those who say, well, we'll just have cheap food, we'll buy it all around the world, no matter where it comes from, and who cares about our own farmers, especially those farmers who will lose access, the privileged access they have to the European market. Our sheep farmers cannot survive if they find themselves in a position where there are extra barriers in place uh, in terms of them accessing the European market. It is their biggest market. 90% of our food and drink exports go there. We would be literally mad if we ignored the fact that we need to sort out access to that European single market first before following fantasies elsewhere. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Chloe. Well, there's one blessing, First Minister. No farmer has time in the middle of the day to watch these proceedings. But when you were over in Ireland recently, I don't know if you had an opportunity to buy anything in a shop in Ireland, but if you did, you would have received a receipt. And on the receipt, it would have said what percentage of the food and drink produce had been produced in Ireland. Now, as we leave the European Union, what are you doing to ensure that we can still sell food for, and drink from Wales over the border and that it is badged up as Welsh produce with a Welsh stamp? And what are you doing to ensure that we retain the PGI status, which has increased the export of lamb by 25% since we gained that status? That is right. There is a question as regards what will happen to PGI and PDO. There is a British system and we don't know whether that system will be on the same level and whether it will be recognised as such. And we must ensure that we protect the lamb of the highest standard. It's accepted across the world, and the same is true of Welsh beef and a number of other products. What we don't wish to see is a situation where our competitors can go into the European market on a level that is better than the level that we would have of entry there. We know at present that the farmers in France and Spain are seeing... a thinking that there is an invitation for them to enter the market because Welsh and British lamb will be more expensive and so they that will not benefit the farmers of Wales. I don't think that you're arguing this, but there is no way of arguing whatsoever that the lamb producers and farmers of Wales will be better outside the single market. Without that market, the future for a number of our farmers will be very bleak indeed. Question 14 of Yarwer. Thank you, Joe. With will the First Minister make a statement on the implications of EU withdrawal for the port of Holyhead? We are pressing the United Kingdom government to ensure that Welsh ports, including Holyhead, will not be disadvantaged uh, following Brexit. I discussed this with businesses in Ireland yesterday. It's crucial that products can still be and goods can be. Uh, moved uh, just as swiftly and seamlessly as before. Thanks for that response. It's worth reminding people that trade through the port of Holyhead increased by almost 700% since the inception of the single market. Now, we cannot afford to see Wales and the port of Holyhead being excluded from a customs union and not part of a single market. I am concerned about the implications of tariffs for trade. New routes would be developed without doubt between Ireland and mainland Europe. There is no room physically in the port of Holyhead to deal with the checks on trucks and lorries and so on. And I'm pleased, unlike your the leader of your party, Jeremy Corbyn, to hear you saying that you believe in remaining in the customs union and the single market. 
But what are you willing to do about that? How far are you willing to push this? Sub-state parliaments in other parts of Europe can have a real influence, a veto even, in certain circumstances over decisions taken by the state. So how far would you want to see the influence of Wales going in terms of deciding on our voice and the powers of Wales once we've left the European Union? There are two points there. One of the things that I was told yesterday is that it's vital that there is no kind of uh, delay in Holyhead or Fishguard. But also we want to ensure that Dover also moves as swiftly because so many goods go through that point. And the danger is that there will be a slowdown in all those ports. There was an example given me of fish being exported. The ferry was... Uh, late crossing the sea and so because of that the lorries missed the the boat as it were in Portsmouth and then the, all those goods perished and we must ensure that it's right to say there is no structure whatsoever in Holyhead or not even in Dover currently. It's impossible to check every lorry and the second question I have stated completely frankly that any agreement should come to this assembly and to Scotland and Northern Ireland hopefully and of course to Westminster and that there should be a vote to agree on that agreement by every parliament and assembly not just in Westminster because without that it's not sustainable. Both the uh, Economy and Infrastructure Skills Committee and the External Affairs Committee um, have uh, gathered evidence from people like the Canadian consulate in Brussels, <coughs> Irish government and others, uh, giving us examples of how uh, low friction trade occurs across borders uh, and through ports. We know the Irish ferries last month confirmed their order for what would be the largest uh, 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 ferry, 165.2 million uh, ferry in the world in terms of vehicle capacity to run between uh, Dublin and Holyhead. And last Thursday, the Economy and Infrastructure Skills Committee took evidence on Anglesey from the from Anglesey um, uh, Economic Zone Board on the Holyhead Port Expansion Plan, which includes provision uh, for uh, Brexit. What consideration, therefore, have you given to the report from the European Parliament? Uh, quote, avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland for customs control and the free movement of persons, which looks at a number of technological solutions and comes to a positive conclusion uh, about how to create a low-friction border. That's from the European Parliament itself. Well, I met with Irish Ferries yesterday, so uh, I discussed with them their plans, and it was good, as I said earlier on, that they are looking to invest in new ships. But the Road Haulage Association in Ireland are very, very concerned about the potential for delay. They don't see border controls, into the, there have been passport controls, but their concern is A, will there be customs checks, and B, will they be um, comprehensive or random? They were never comprehensive in the past, they were always random. Uh, and in reality, there is no other way of doing customs checks without having miles and miles of traffic uh, queuing. My argument is this, I want to see an open border between North and South and Ireland. I know that border exceptionally well, uh, and I know it's impossible to, uh, to, to seal it, if that's the word you want to use, in any event. In the days of, of, the, of the Troubles, minor roads were blown up by the British Army, and there were crossing points at various uh, main roads. That's before there was a motorway built uh, across the border. So in reality, it's impossible to police that border from a customs perspective. Good, if a way is found of doing that, I have no argument. But my argument is this, the same arrangements must apply to the maritime border between Ireland and Wales. We can't afford to have a situation where the maritime border is seen as more difficult, more bureaucratic, uh, and more troublesome for freight operators than the border between North and South in Ireland. Why? There's an incentive there for goods to move through Northern Ireland into the Scottish ports and into Liverpool and to avoid the Welsh ports if that border is seen as more problematic. If it applies to one, it has to apply to all. Question pimp, Lee. Question five, Lee Water. What uh, assessment has the First Minister made of the Centre for Cities analysis that 112,000 workers could face losing their jobs in Swansea, Cardiff and Newport alone as a result of automation? Well, predictions of this sort are never straightforward, but uh, we know that there will be a, a destruction of some jobs by new technology that we have to accept. The question, of course, then is, 
Can we then be a net creator of jobs through advances in technologies? And addressing challenges and opportunities presented by automation and uh, digitisation is at the heart of our economic action plan. Thank you. The conditions are consistent with other analyses. China recently unveiled plans for a £1.5 billion research park dedicated to the development of artificial intelligence. The United Arab Emirates have appointed a minister for AI and announced a cross-government strategy. Their Prime Minister Sheikh Mohammed has said, we want the UAE to become the world's most prepared country for artificial intelligence. Countries all across the world are gearing up to face the challenges and grasp the opportunities that automation presents. And Wales needs to act fast to be a shaper, not just an adopter of new technologies. Does the First Minister agree we need cross-government action and will he commit to establishing a unit to get Wales ready for automation? We do need cross-government action, there's no question about that, because I know that the Piper Tewitt of the member has a huge interest uh, in this and he flags up uh, an issue that we, a challenge that we must uh, meet in the future. Well, I can say that groups across Welsh Government are already exploring the impact of technology and data on public service delivery. We obviously work with, with businesses. I know the Cabinet Secretary is considering the creation of a fintech a task and finish group to look at the technologies surrounding financial and professional services. Uh, building on the digital action plan, uh, that lays out our own commitments to improving our own uh, digital services, and we are working with the UK Government as well. Actively engaged with the recently launched UK Knowledge Transfer Networks for Manufacturing Initiative, which is aimed at realising you recognise the phrase, of course, the fourth industrial uh, revolution, and uh, uh, that team is exploring ways to optimise the application of that programme to Wales. Uh, there are other uh, programmes that we have uh, taken forward, but I can assure the member uh, that we, we know that, ch that the challenge is there, and we intend to meet that challenge. Nick Ramsey. Dioch, uh, First Minister Lee Waters uh, just rightly referred to the urban hubs of South Wales as being most vulnerable in the first instance to the effect of automation and the figures that Lee Ward has quoted were astounding. I agreed with your answer that we need to make sure that we are uh, trying to get ahead of the curve in terms of uh, competing with other countries in this respect and making sure that the challenges posed by artificial intelligence are dealt with. Uh, but I didn't hear uh, your answer. Can you give us some concrete examples of how you are going to refocus Welsh Government economic policies to face these challenges ahead to make sure that areas such as Newport, Cardiff and Swansea also other urban area, areas of Wales, but also the city regions areas which they support and which support them will also be able to meet the challenge of the future and get ahead of the curve which we desperately need. Well, our economic action plan clearly identifies the automation uh, and digitalisation challenges that we face, key strategic uh, challenges and opportunities. Just to build on the uh, answer I gave to the member for uh, Llanelli, we will be launching our enhanced smart innovation business support in April 2018 for manufacturing and design uh, processes. That will include support to businesses for planning and preparing for the implementation of technologies associated with the fourth industrial uh, revolution. And over the last 12 months, Industry Wales has supplied a number of reports to the Cabinet Secretary on the risks and opportunities that automation will have on the Welsh economy. Question Chwech, Darren Miller. Question six, Darren Miller. First Minister, make a statement on the Welsh Government's relationships with international governments and sub-regional administrations. Yes, we have relations with many governments and sub-regional governments at many different levels and through different channels, both formal and informal. Thank you for that answer, First Minister. At the beginning of the year, Open Doors published its annual World Watch list, which is a list of the world's worst persecuting nations uh, for Christians uh, to be uh, living in. And many of the uh, nations which are mentioned on that list are nations which the Welsh Government has uh, relationships with, Pakistan, India, Qatar, Vietnam, uh, as an example. Uh, now, clearly, where the Welsh Government has a relationship, it has a dialogue uh, with, uh, with those governments. And I wonder what action the Welsh Government uh, is taking or could take in order to discuss uh, the uh, infringement of Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for Christians living in those nations where their right to, uh, to change their religion and their right to practice their religion is not being realised. Of course, uh, an individual's right to freedom of conscience. Uh, I have raised human rights issues in the past in uh, some countries that I have been uh, to, not shied away from that. Of course, we take advice from the Foreign Office, uh, hugely important with their network of um, embassies and, of course, their access to intelligence uh, that we take advice uh, from them. Uh, but nobody, of course, uh, could possibly uh, condone a situation where freedom of conscience is not respected. Adam Price. Um, 
Some regional governments, such as Flanders, for example, as Rina Bjorworth pointed out earlier, do have a veto over the final terms of the Brexit agreement that Wales doesn't currently have. Now, of course, as the First Minister will be aware, there is a historic link, a very close historic link between Wales and Flanders. Would the First Minister consider leading a delegation to Flanders to appeal to them, if necessary, to use the powers that they have to assist Wales in our hour of need, as Wales did in their thousands a hundred years ago on their behalf? Well, I visited Flanders a number of times, of course, and as the member says, there is a historic connection and it's also a very sad connection between Wales and Flanders. Well, what's important for me is that we urge the United Kingdom government to give us some kind of indication of what their plans are because nobody has a clue at the moment what exactly they wish to see at the end of this process and we wish to ensure through the discussions taking place at present that first of all the bill the withdrawal bill will be amended in a way which is acceptable to wales and also to scotland and also to urge the united kingdom government to secure an agreement which will be a benefit to both wales and of course the uk oh, uh, thank you uh, what work has the first minister done since the referendum with international governments outside the eu to encourage investment into wales Many things. I've uh, been to many countries. Uh, the US, of course, is our biggest international investing country. I've, I've been there. I was in Ireland yesterday. Ireland is in the top five uh, of investing countries in, uh, in Wales. Uh, of course, we look at markets outside uh, Europe. Uh, one of the first things, that, one of the things I did when I was a rural affairs minister was to get Welsh lamb into Dubai, uh, looking at a new market beyond the traditional southern European market. But nevertheless, uh, we cannot, on the one hand, say we need to look at new markets, which we accept, but on the other hand, say we have to ignore our most important existing single market, which is Europe. The two things run together. Let's make sure that we secure our most important market first, and then, of course, make sure that we look for greater opportunity, for more opportunities rather, elsewhere. Question, South, Gareth. Question seven, Gareth Ben. What steps is the Welsh Government taking to improve the welfare of puppies and dogs in Wales? Well, we take uh, animal welfare seriously and expect others to do so too. The Animal Welfare Breeding of Dogs Wales Regulations 2014 introduced stricter criteria for licensed puppy breeders and we recently consulted on a revised code of practice for the welfare of dogs and the code reminds owners of their responsibilities and obligations. Uh, yes, thanks. <coughs> thanks for the previous initiatives. Uh, the UK Government is currently looking at bringing in tighter regulations for dog breeding um, in England. Uh, in the light of that, is it, um, is it possible that we may need to look at tighter regulations again in Wales, given recent cases, such as Lucy's Law? Well, I mean, I have to say that uh, DEFRA followed us. Yeah. Uh, actually, we were the first to introduce uh, regulations of this sort, and DEFRA is now following suit. We do note yeah. the fact that DEFRA have issued a call of evidence on the banning of third-party sales, and we consider our own position in, on, in due course. But this is certainly a situation where we were ahead of the game and others are following. Joyce Watson. Uh, well, uh, and in recent years, the sale of puppies and dogs has moved to online sales. And many sick animals have been sold to unsuspecting uh, people. And those uh, sellers are very often not licensed uh, to breed. It, and they're certainly not putting the welfare of the animals first, but profit. And the Blue Cross are calling for a registration and licensing system, system for anyone uh, breeding or selling animals through any means whatsoever. So whether that's from home or from large-scale breeding establishments to include online sellers. Do you think this is something that we uh, might consider doing uh, here in the Welsh Government? I think it's in, there are two issues here. Firstly, to examine whether there's a need for further legislation, but secondly, to ensure that enforcement is what we would want it and expect it to, uh, to be. Uh, I know that local authorities in Wales have recently undertaken a data capture survey on licensed dog breeding premises in Wales, and that exercise has served as an opportunity to assess the standards currently applied to dog breeders in Wales, to identify and investigate examples of poor compliance, best practice, and also to improve intelligence to better inform enforcement intervention by local authorities. So the enforcement, of course, is hugely important in terms of the current law. 
Question eight, Trianon Passmore. Will the First Minister give an update on uh, Welsh Government plans to enhance, enhance educational facilities in its line? Well, Band A of the 21st Century Schools programme will see investment of over £58 million in schools in uh, Caerphilly County Borough, with over £28 million spent in the Islewyn constituency, and a funding envelope for Caerphilly of over £110 million for Band B, continuing or rather beginning in 2019, has been approved in principle. Uh, thank you. The Welsh Government also has announced an extra £73 million allocated to the 21st Century Schools Education Programme, and this brings the total amount invested to £3.8 billion. First Minister, as you witnessed yourself when you formally opened Isline High, the infrastructure of Welsh schools are being reimagined and rebuilt to serve future generations. How, then, can this radical, transformative initiative be maintained in the years ahead so Wales never has to witness again the decaying school building? Buildings of the Thatcher and Major eras when the Conservatives were last in charge of educational government policy in Wales. Well, many of us were in school in the 1980s, and despite the best efforts of our teachers, we were taught in buildings that uh, were falling apart. Porter cabins. Uh, I remember one porter cabin where there was ivy growing up the inside of the wall because there was a gap between the floor and the wall. I saw heating systems that didn't work. I saw no new schools being built. Compare that to now. Compare that to now. Where we have over 150 schools and colleges in Wales which will be refurbished or replaced in the five years to 2019. That's 150 schools and colleges that under the Tories would have been left to decay. Finally, Mohammed Ashkar. Sir, further to that question, could the First Minister advise when details of which schools and colleges and South East Wales will be modernised under Band B of the 21st century schools and education programmes will be announced and how will these building schemes address the growth in demand for Welsh medium education in my region especially? Well, I can say that uh, as far as Caerphilly is concerned, the Gwindy campus is complete, the Stone High School is opened, uh, Pontlotin and Abatasug replacement schools, construction is underway uh, there. Uh, and, of course, there is the New Idris Davis Primary School, which will be uh, built as well, just to give uh, some examples. But, as I said to the member earlier on, uh, it is rich for the Tories to say, well, you know, give us an example of schools being built when they would have built nothing. They would have built nothing at all. 150 schools and colleges that have been rebuilt, built or refurbished by Welsh Labour that the Tories would never have touched. Thank you. For